want to welcome to the stage Melissa Rule. Thank you, Allison, and thank you to Core 77 and CES for hosting Arup. For those of you who don't know, Arup is a large group of uh, about 15,000 engineers, industrial engineers, structural engineers, bridge engineers. And what I do is work with cities before the engineering starts to advise them on what type of engineering they need to do and other policies that, that inform the infrastructure. So I'm gonna walk us through uh, a common problem that I, I know we have all experienced, certainly I've experienced recently, uh, in the built environment. So you're, you're, at, you're at home, you're um, you know, involved in whatever you're doing, you've lost track of time, and you realize you're late. So you look into your options. You can drive, but parking is a nightmare and you don't wanna do that. You can um, take transit, but it's really slow and you'll get there even later. You could take micromobility, but it looks like there are no e-scooters or no e-bikes near you. So you call Lyft. When the Lyft arrives, there's no parking spot for the Lyft to pull over in, fr in front of your, um, your building. There's a FedEx there. They're occupying the only, um, the only loading zone. So the uh, Lyft pulls into the uh, fire hydrant space, and it should be quick. There shouldn't be any problems with that. It's going to be in and out. So you run across the street, you get in the lift, and you go. Once you arrive at your destination, again, there are no loading zones. So the, the driver, she has a choice of either pulling into the bike lane uh, near your, your destination or pulling into a transit stop. And so she chooses this tra transit stop. But of course, as you're gathering your bags, behind you a bus pulls up and they give a little, a little honk on their massive vehicle. So you run, you give them a wave, you try to avoid the cyclist that's going through the bike lane and you make it. And you had a lot of mini crises, but it's fine. You don't even remember, it's so normal. Well, how many conflicts did you create in the built environment? There was the freight loading. The FedEx didn't have enough uh, spaces to, to actually unload their vehicle. There was emergency access. The lift actually blocked emergency access by parking in that, in that space. And of course, there was no passenger loading, which created the whole problem to begin with. Numerous times you ran in the street, uh, creating all sorts of um, troubles for you and others. There was an unprotected bike facility that you ran in front of, the transit stop, there, there was a lot going on that uh, you created problems for. I, I love this image, it's of Chinatown in San Francisco. You can see how incredibly complex it is. There are a number of buses pulling in and out, there's a UPS vehicle, um, cars are uh, variously going over the line, you can see pedestrians, it's a mess, all of the wires, you can tell that this is ripe for disruption. This looks like an old system needing to be modernized. And of course, it's just getting worse. Transportation network companies, the regulatory term for Uber and Lyft, are creating higher and higher demand for access at the curb. You have private transit in the Bay Area where, where I work. That's a pretty, it's a pretty big deal and it's becoming more common. In fact, uh, employers, provide more transit than the vast majority of transit agencies in the Bay Area. They need the, uh, the curb, they need the public infrastructure. Then of course you have e-commerce, year over year we're seeing massive growth in e-commerce happening at the holiday season but also throughout the year while brick and mortar uh, buildings are closing. So the pressure for uh, just-in-time delivery is going up and up and up and up. Of course, you also have hot food delivery, which is creating uh, the, the crazy scenario of picking up hot food and delivering it really quickly uh, all around the city. Some, some buildings see 50% of their deliveries are hot food, which creates a pretty uh, packed scenario at the, at the curb. And of course, it's only going to get more intense. These valuations uh, are just estimates, but we know that the autonomous vehicle industry could grow to trillions in the next decade or two. It's a massive industry that's going to disrupt everything. It's going to have an impact on how people access buildings, 
driveways, parking lots, parking garages are going to be infrastructure of the past if they're not already in some locations. Instead, you're going to have passenger loading. You're going to have the need for service centers, for staging areas, a completely new vision of what parking looks like uh, will be coming soon. You also have the driver side and the passenger side of vehicles that guides our entire vision of the street won't make sense anymore. What will the, the street look like when the driver side is anywhere or nowhere? When the passenger side is both sides, front, back, it can change. The whole design can, can uh, morph. And of course, our intersections are managed right now by simple calculators. The, the computers that are regulating our entire network are, are very simple. They are well before the age of the personal computer. And that is the core skeleton of our cities. We're also going to have services that are going to change dramatically. Depending on your need, you, are, you will be able to call a different kind of vehicle. You already can in a lot of ways, in a way that you couldn't 10 years ago. And then also, you know, the, the new prolif proliferation of ad cars, of zombie cars or, or empty vehicles, of all sorts of different types of vehicles that, that don't look like what, what vehicles look like today will proliferate. Or will they? 50 years ago, we thought that we would be a spacefaring civilization, we would live in the sky. We had visions of the future that were phenomenal and very much not what we're living in now. So how do we design the future uh, with so much uncertainty? But we do have some certainty. We know that our infrastructure today doesn't work for cities. It's unhealthy, it's killing us. Um, literally, people are dying on the streets, 40,000 in the US, 1.25 globally, million globally are dying. Um, and that's actually old data, I'm sure it's quite a bit higher now. Uh, pollution is giving babies asthma. It's, it's, it's not great, it's, it's a pretty poor situation. But we know how to fix it. We know that we need to learn to live together better in cities, we need to make uh, our energy consumption dramatically more efficient. We need to enable active mobility, including macro mobility, to work on city streets for people to feel safe, for women and men, children and elderly, to get out on, on the streets and be active. So what are three things that we can do today, given our uncertainty? There are a lot of visions of the future where you have uh, streets that are um, where there are no lines, where you have pedestrians walking and you have intelligent uh, cars reacting to the pedestrians, where you have trees, you have beauty, you have spontaneity. But that is a far future. We don't have the abilities for, for that design quite yet for the majority of our streets. For the majority of our streets, we need clarity. We need pedestrians to have wide sidewalks with clear curbs. We need bike lanes that are protected from vehicle traffic. And we need lines for, frankly, autonomous vehicles. Right now, they need to know what the lines are. They need to know what the signs say. They need to know what the policies of the street are. And of course, we need, as, as I started out, Passenger loading, passenger loading, passenger loading. This is the Arup building in San Francisco, and uh, you can see that there's the little green line. It's probably not very visible. Um, the green lines point to passenger loading. There are multiple passenger loading points. There are multiple pedestrian access points, the little blue circles. There's a good loading, goods loading space. Of course, this is a large 30-some story building, but that sort of design is going to be more common. Large buildings are going to be more common. What this is lacking is good bike infrastructure, but otherwise it has a lot of what we need. We're gonna need digital inventories. It's a bit shocking to people uh, how little cities know about their infrastructure. They don't know where their curbs are. And when they do, they don't know what the policies of the curbs are. That's someone else's department. Or that's something that one department has for one district. Or it's multiple different files using multiple different standards that haven't been updated in years. And the expense to send some interns, you know, is the, the famous thing, to send interns to the street is, is, ex 
you know, very, very high. And it's very uh, static. It's a view of the city that is now, not always. So we need to find a way to digitally uh, inventory our infrastructure and our infrastructure policies. And of course, charging infrastructure. We cannot move into the 21st century. We cannot address this climate crisis that's before us if we don't have the infrastructure to, to move from fossil fuels to renewable energies. Uh, this is something that needs to happen at the local, at the regional, at the state, at the national, and at the international levels with design standards, with research collaborations, with conversations happening and money being put towards building infrastructure commonly throughout in residential buildings, on streets, uh, at employers, at retail outfits. We need to have infrastructure enabled for all forms of electric mobility. So, you know, I'm always asked, this is probably the number one question that my clients ask me, when? <laughs> when are autonomous vehicles coming? When can we not have drivers? When do we need to transition our labor? When are we going to need to change our fleet? When are we going to need to change our staffing, uh, our experience, our expertise? And that answer is always really hard. We don't know. Uh, companies put out there all sorts of bullish predictions, and then you know they walk back or, or they kind of obfuscate an, an, an exact number. Uh, we don't know when, but we know that people don't like inconvenience, and we need to become a whole lot more efficient now, yesterday. So we need to do the things that we know we can do to make our cities much more efficient to address this climate crisis and to prepare for future change. So why wait for tomorrow? Thank you.